Welcome every Tuesday, April the 2nd, March the 13th. Here we go, another day. Alrighty, everybody, I've got about 25 minutes left. If somebody else would like to call in, 347-688-2902. You had Freedom Screens on Skype. So just a second here as I tune into the stream energies. I was doing a, an emotional energy read here. So <clears throat> the first energy is the turtle energy. That's where I left off. The turtle is the amphibious soul. It can live in water and it can live on land and go from lake to lake to lake. The turtle is also a hunter, something many people don't realize about the turtle. The turtle will stay deep under the water and wait for a fish to go by and shoot out its head and grab the fish and bring it in. All things, all species are a part of this food chain we're in. Humans have a second rule. Their food chain is separate of the way the food chain of the animals. For the turtle concept, the turtle can also exist in our food chain in the form of the sacred feminine energy connecting us to Earth Mother. The turtle has a shell upon its back and it can bring its arms and legs and neck inside the shell so it's protected from predators so it can once again be not a part of the food chain. And this particular skill of the turtle is teaching us how to create this energetic shell around us so that nothing can harm us in this food chain. Understanding what is the food chain is something that many people have their disconnect with. There are positive, negative, and neutral spirits in the world, and oftentimes all of them make you a part of the food chain. The beings of light make you a part of the light food chain where other light beings come to you and heal you and give you energy. And that is what's known as a secondary food chain, beings of light healing you. And then the dark forces come and take energy from you, and that is their food chain. Oop, just a second here. I got another call. Andre, how you doing today? Andre, are you there? Earth to Andre. Unmute your mic. <laughs> Mr. Andre, are you there? Oh, I got red bars. All right, are we back? Andre, are you there? Hey, mate, how are you? Good, how are you doing today? Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. I um, was sort of sitting here and I was just having my finger on the Skype ring and it sort of rang automatically. So I'm here <laughs> with you. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? <laughs> so uh, how can I help you today? You want a reading? Do you just want to talk? What's going on? Yeah, well, you know, you and I have interacted quite a bit on the roundtables and stuff, which probably maybe your listeners aren't familiar with. But um, I just want to say, like, since I've interacted with you, a lot of lot of stuff has happened in my existence. And I think it's probably, when I reflect on it, that first time you scammed me, it was pretty much based about that scam, because I think you healed me greatly, or you activate a lot. And... um I'd like to know a bit about my past. Nope. And, I mean, I, I trust what you know. You probably have a lot of the information that I need to hear anyway. So I'll just sit back and listen. All right. So what I want you to do is uh, tell me the first 10 minutes of your day, and you, you kind of know how it works. Be descriptive. The more descriptive you are about that first 10 minutes, the deeper I can go right off the bat. Yeah. Well, I, um, I have been observing that in me. Um, a lot more than it being automatic so I was aware of it this morning and I I woke up and I observed my body to see if there's aches and pains and just to get peace um, I usually listen to an interview on my mobile phone and um, the battery's a bit flat so I usually charge it up and then I just let myself wake up and feel peace and get up and stretch a bit um, Did you dream last night? I think I dream every night, but I'm trying to really connect into it more since listening to you and um, interacting. Okay. Um, I've, I've tuned into your energies. And what what the first energy that I get off the bat is your literal ability to respond to the needs of others. That is the skill you have in this lifetime that very few people in your area really have. Uh, right away, your first impression of people is more accurate than, than the vast majority of the shamans in this world. What I call this as, as, as flash camera psychic sensing. 
it's like when a flash goes off, it reveals the red eye and the things that, that the flash kinds of reveals. So you do this psychic first impression flash and right away you go to the top three things that are around, that are wrong or right with that person. And when you put together those patterns of what that energy means, you understand that each person can be responded to differently, but they all have a common pattern. Have they sought their skills? Have they found their skills? Are they on the path to opposition or on the path to inner peace? So right away, you have a compass gauge about that person so that you know if they can lead you into the direction you're looking for or if they're just somebody traveling on the path with you. Because ultimately, you're going through the ocean streams of time and space and consciousness exploration looking for that spark that ignites you to go to the next level, to dream in a way you haven't dreamed over and over before, to think in a way you haven't thought before, to have clarity like you've never had before, to fly high with the eagles of self-expression. So right now, the eagles of self-expression are coming to you, and they're using their eagle claw high in the air, and you're the person on the ground straining your eyes in the sunlight to get a glimpse of that eagle that's calling way up there. When in fact that eagle is you in another form, in another vision. So that that separation that you have is time for you to use that psychic pulse that you have, that flash energy to understand you are connected to the great source of great mystery. Currently, you have a placenta of energy around you. That is the nurturing energy of Earth Mother. That nurturing energy of Earth Mother has led you away from the system of, of monetary money and into the nurturing arms of teachers that are around you that you have manifested and they have co-manifested you because you are part of their soul group. You begin this process of healing and connecting to the original source because you're looking for the truth of our world, the truth of consciousness exploration. And as you explore, explore the truth of consciousness exploration, you have learned that it can create a shield of energy around you where untruth people cannot penetrate. So what it is is you're trying to share this wisdom of how to create a wall of truth where nothing that is lies can get through. Is this making sense to you so far? Totally, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. So, so this, this wall of truth that you're putting up is something you have to understand that every wall has a concept. Is it a fortress? Is it this blank energy shield that nothing that is lies can get by? Does it have weapons that are mounted on it so that nothing else that is lie, lie weapons can penetrate? So you're at this state of compass direction. Do I want to have some of the warrior in me? Do I want to have all of the healer in me? Do I want a balance of all three? Or is there a singular concept I haven't come up yet to empower this wall of truth? So as you're in those creating moments, you're going to understand that some of these concepts you have to give away because they're dividing your energy. Even though you have a wall of truth above you, the energy of exploration and co-creation is limited because there are so many extra ideas in your mind. And just like the other caller, it's time for a giveaway, time for a release of the old concepts so that energy may return to you so your wall of truth may gain stronger and you explore the next layer of truth that says, what are my new abilities? What is it that I want to manifest? Is there a place of power that I need to be in or is this the place of power that I'm standing on now with the soul group that I have? The very concept of the ceremonial new abilities it means that your soul is saying you need to honor yourself with the facts that you've already graduated all of the big things in your life. And you simply need to have that cap and gown ceremony. So you understand that it's time for you to make a, a personal ritual that says, I've graduated. Now it's time for me to walk my talk and own my skills just like I did in previous times of my life where I take these skills that I've healed myself with so I may heal others, so I may help other people have goals, so they may build their own wall of fortress of truth, so that they can ultimately understand that the sacrifice is from the self. You can give people all the wisdom, but it doesn't mean that they will take partake of the wisdom. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Same concept. So it's for you to stop telling people to change, even though you don't really do that anymore. But you also know that you have to at least say it so somebody has that spark, that seed in with them, so that when change is ready, 
that there's already that little seedling in there that could grow into new allies. And that's kind of what you're looking for is who can be the future student of you. And I know that you're having a tough time with that term students, but it's really time that you took on some concept of that in your consciousness exploration because there's new allies for you. There are people that are trying to get to you because you're a part of their soul group and they have specific soul contracts with you because you're going to teach them in a way that you really don't understand yet. The, the fact that you've created this fortress of truth, this wall of truth, means you've done something that very few people in your area have done. So it's going to be relating around the stone people, the crystals and the mineral people. You're going to find yourself going out and rock hounding, finding yourself in the music of life, naturally picking up the best rocks of the area. Some of them may look like nothing that is special, but to you it is a stone you found in your spiritual journey representative of what was going on in your mind. And that spiritual journey, you're going to want to bring others on simply because it's safe. It's not safe to travel in the bush alone. When's the last time you've gone out to the bush? The bush, like, uh, into the outback or yep. just into the outback. Place? Into the outback. Yeah, yeah. Many, many years, many years. So. What, 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 what's what been that that stopped you from going out there? Uh, just playing catch up in my life. Like you're saying, um, a lot of things have happened and um, uh, like you said, I was taken away from money, which was true. I had huge amounts of money than I have had none. So now I'm just getting a balance back on that, which is all experience, you know. I've learned to meet my needs rather than my wants and that. So, um, but yeah, it's... I know I'm very fortunate. There's pretty much nothing I can't do if I put my mind to it. Mm -hmm. And I've usually got too many options. So, um, yeah, what you're saying resonates totally. So So when I said the word time for you to have students, was there a taste in your mouth? A bit dry. Yep, it's dry. Do you want to have students now, or is that something in your mind you're saying, no, 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 a single student can corrupt the teacher? It's, I think... There's that realization of being a reluctant teacher. Okay. You know, I'm happy. I'm happy to give a bit out here and there, but once people get hooked into me, I've I've been very familiar with that. I have to be very. You've had some interesting callers, and I I think about me, and I I'm a totally random pattern. I never go on the same pattern any way or any time or any place because um, people get familiar with me and they get attached. So I have to be you know, aware of that, not in fear of it, because I am sensitive in that respect. But it's finding the right characteristics in a say a pupil. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's a good thing to be a, a humble sort of teacher because you're always searching yourself. But I sort of have come to the conclusion that there's not many that know as much as I do now. And I say that humbly. So it's yep. time to really I, I in the meditations and stuff that I go to, I've sort of realized I need to put it all together in a form that I can put it out there. Yep. And I have been told I'm going to write books and stuff like that. I just... You are. Um, um, you mentioned how you did a fire ceremony this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, my tough period has been since May 2008, and I had a pair of sneakers that I threw out just on Monday night, which was... You were fired up last night as well, and I wrote down everything I did, achieved, good or bad, over that time of those sneakers, because not having much money, I walk a lot. Like, I walk hundreds of kilometres or thousands of kilometres over the last couple of years, and I burnt that, and sort of that ceremony sort of thing that you've been saying to many people, and I did a little ceremony for myself of that great accomplishment, so... In doing that, I've sort of changed my energies as well. It's you have. taking responsibility, you know. So, um, and I hear it in all your callers, you know, they're all going through it. And even though our experiences are unique, they're relevant to us individually. And the other thing, you talked about that bubble of truth. I visualize myself in the eye of a hurricane. So the people that are worthy they filter through, but the people that are dishonest and misguided and stuff, they get hit by the, you know, the wall of the hurricane. And sometimes I 
I'm not in the middle. I get caught up in the edge of it in my own world, you know. So I've got to just remember to be centered and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I I did a, I didn't want to call in yesterday because I thought the archive wouldn't be good. So I, um, I'll need to listen to it a few times, as you know. So, oh yeah. So this yeah. is what I'm what I'm getting for you. you. You've just told a level of truth in your soul that you you haven't really reached before. There were, there's a new level of exploration here. Because you burned your, spe- your sneakers, you truly understand where your feet have gone. Now there's a whole new – I asked you about the bliss for a reason because you're going to be called to go out there and to do a sharing of energy, to open up the spirit talking stip, to literally open up a spot of energy where people can sit down and burn their sneakers. Okay, okay. That's, that's in metaphor and in reality. So there are going to be two or three people that are that are ready to burn their sneakers in their own way. And what they're going to do is you're, you're, you're teaching to them is to tell them to write down a good portion of their story. You're going to go out to, to somewhere that's safe in the bush, that's away from the cities. You're going to start a fire, and you're going to start giving away the old stories. So when they return, they're a whole new person. And the wall of truth, this, this energy of truth, is truly about understanding that the hurricane goes round and round and round. And every time it goes round, it moves forward a few kilometers and forward a few kilometers because the hurricane stands still. So no. this purifying energy, this releasing of energy, this connecting to the spirit world, this sharing of energy is going to set the pathway for those true students that are going to come to you. Because these first three people that go with you are going to be transitory students. They're going to give away just enough. their sp- spirit contract with you to go and do this with that part of the land just so they can have that experience so that they can be out of their hurricane and onto dry land, dried out, and then they can create their own concept instead of a hurricane. It might be a tornado. For one person, it might be a fortress. Each of them will create their own versions of truth. And as those people fade away, a very new thing is going to come into your life. And it's going to be like, I I simply describe it as dancers. People are going to dance into your life. Uh, Have you ever seen Sufi dancers? I would have, yeah. I I just need to confirm 100%. Okay. They dance in circles, dance in spirals. They, They come in with this high energy, and when all of a sudden they stop dancing and they go into a meditative state. This new set of students are going to come into you like that. A a great, I don't know, like a tidal wave of energies is going to bring them in, and then they're going to stop and have these intense meditative moments around you, and you're going to start using your camouflage psychic ability, and you're going to see the types of universal source they're connecting to. Mm -hmm. And your wall of truth was going to become their protection for a while. Um, they, these, these people that are coming in, they're, they're from another soul group. They're coming to meet you because you're a ship on the ocean in the sea of time right now. And you have a set of instruments that allows you to gauge the very nature of time. And because you've mastered the single skill of the psychic flash, you understand that you can do the psychic flash on the very nature of time itself. So your level of consciousness exploration is going to help these that are in that worthy dervish of energy to heal. You're going to surround them with your wall of truth and none of the lies will get in. And as that core group forms, you're going to understand that you're going to link to them in an almost ant-hive-like fashion. And it will be scary at first for you and for them because then you'll realize not only are they temporary students, they are soul brothers and sisters. And that right there is where you're determined you won't be a single ship on the ocean of time you'll be a fleet of ships, okay? And that fleet of ships, the ocean of time, will take you into the next level where the thunderstorms of the oceans cannot affect you, where the waves of time cannot affect you, and those beings that are trying to control and affect the very nature of time itself will not affect you. You'll find yourself nurturing these people with wisdom and knowledge, and they will return wisdom and knowledge and inner prayer and peace with you they will share their healing process and their healing method, and you will understand the true counting coop of victory. The counting coop is where you go back and reclaim all of the victories of your life. When's the last time you made just the good thing, a list of just the great victories you've had in your life, none of the negatives? I haven't done it, but I, in writing that thing that I've done, I realized I've had a lot, you know, just in that last couple of years. So. Yep. 
yeah, probably a good thing to do. Yep. So the next layer here, after you understand that this this whirling dervish of energy is going to come into your hurricane of truth, there's going to be this shaman's rebirth in you, where just like the old caller, you're going to give away something else other than your sneakers. There was a pen that you may have used to sign a thousand checks or to, to sign bills of waiting or to a keyboard or something, something that represented the time that you were in money that you're going to give away so that the true shaman, the true consciousness exploration that's on the boat in the sea of time will be able to rebirth into. I mean, you already know in your, in your, in your dreams, you travel deep and far and in your consciousness exploration, there's, there's a great explorer there. And this world has limited you so much. The reason you went into the concept of money is you wanted to be immersed in that energy of money to know that once it's time to change, we have to change it with a true unlimited vision. We cannot use the old world to define new money. And once we learn to define new money, it is based on the women, based on those that give birth to this life. The men are there to support the women and to support it in a tribe-like fashion. So it's a balancing of all of these energies within you. So as you retreat into the feminine energy during this time of co-creation with the new soul group, you're going to find a drum. Do you play drums now? I don't, but I've done thing with my shaman healer, which I've loved okay. even more so just recently. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm thinking it's time you're going to make, you literally make your own drum. You're going to find the proper piece of wood and you're going to make it just like the same person who manifested all the things they wanted when they were in the money system. But you're going to be separate of that. All of that energy is going to be removed and you're going to have all of your 100% focus. And that 100% focus will allow you to beat that drum for the first time and say, I did it. I manifested this thing with my own two hands in this drum that I beat. All of those other people that are on this ocean waves of time will hear this drum echoing over the wall. And then they will drum. And then there'll be a fleet of drummers on the ocean waves of time. And you will create a pattern, and that pattern will literally change time itself. You're a time you're a time warrior this lifetime. Well, I actually had lost time last year, like about November last year, and now I lost time, which I know. So Well, there's a reason you lost time, because your ship struck ground for a short period of time on the oceans of time, and you got off your ship, and you needed to repair it. And as you were repairing it, you were brought into another time stream and another time world. And those whirling dervishes were in that world, and you helped free them, and now they're back into the real time stream. And as you began to sail again, those whirling dervishes that healed made their own boat and are now searching for you in the waves of time. Interesting. Thank you very much, mate. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Did you have any questions? A million questions, but I think the show is going to end. So maybe I'll just absorb what you've given me and um, listen to the archive and be in touch and see you around the traps. Yep. Thank, thank you got, very much, mate. I got one more. I got one more thing for you. All right. Sure. The the energy now for you today, something for you to do is you got to tell your story. You, you told the story of the sneakers, but there, there's more of your story you're not telling. And it's not about the lost time. It's just about some of the more mundane things you've done. And once you start letting more of more of the mundane things, it's going to be, it's like your, your, your ship on the ocean of time is going to get an outboard motor. Okay. okay. And yeah. I mean, literally an outboard motor, there'll be a wake behind your ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to like surfing, so bring on the waves, yeah. But, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Appreciate it. You're welcome, and call in any time you want, man. You're, you're a great explorer. Yeah, practice. yeah. So to, to get back into the dreaming skill set, so we were talking about how it's everyone's yeah, yeah, teaching it everyone. People, yeah. And then there are other dream states where um, it's – I just hear talking, talking, talking. Now, many people get that experience, but it is very much enhanced during moments of solar flares. Yes. Like when the solar flare first erupts, there's that instant spark that anything, it doesn't matter how far you're away you are, you get the first impression, and then the wave is coming towards you, could take three to five days to get to you. And then once it hit, it's another two days. 
So the second the spark comes off as the first wave, it's coming to you is creating a wave. It's hitting its creating wave, and its dissipation is creating a wave that is making you out of sync with your dreaming body Mm -hmm. because it's asking you to be awake during those times so you can take in the solar radiation in conscious application of the sacred so you can create an aurora borealis above yourself. That's some spiritual technology I haven't talked about as how to literally create light around yourself. Um, Now's a good time. We can do that in our own dream world where Steve was talking about, you know, you just created the wings and flew up into the air and all of a sudden things were, you were simplified. A vision that you can create is a fountain of rainbow energy coming out of you and illuminating absolutely everything around you erasing the sacred geometry system the whirling rainbow the whirling rainbow Mm -hmm. unity and wholeness achieved now the whirling rainbow is the dreaming mind of earth and it is a portal to everywhere and the void space so you know i know andre has a lot of understandings as well what what is your dream time being like since these last solar flares have been just doing their dance with our, our earth and ourselves to be honest, I, I don't have a, a huge connection yet. I, I've gone through a three-year bankruptcy, and I've actually done a lot of clearing this last month. I was totally shut down a few weeks before it, and I blocked everyone out, and and I actually did the whole colonic thing. So I'm actually wanting to go to another level, but um, and that, that's been profound for me. Like, I, you've said it for so many years, mate, and I'm like, yep, 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 yep. But then I like I observed my um, my life and the three years of bankruptcy, and I I took it as like potentially a pretty traumatic experience, and I accepted that maybe there's something I'm not here that I'm not seeing, so I'll, I'll go thorough now because it's it's 2015 and shakeout year, so I'm not going to give myself any avenue for attack if you know what I mean. So I'm I'm, I'm integrating at the moment, but there's there's one funny dream that I had. And it's the show that you had Dawn on. And for me, I was I was really beaten up. I was really tired and I was just like not up for getting up at five in the morning to watch it. And I was in this dream, okay? And I was just like, I used to play basketball as a kid. And um, I was having a real cool casual game of basketball. And then all of a sudden, like Jim Carrey from from Cable Guy came in and shellac blocked me. <laughs> and I was like, what the <laughs> And I swear it was you, Andrew, and it was like, wake up, sunshine, you're meant to be listening to this show, and it was like, I got cable guide by Andrew my dream. <laughs> and Jim Carrey's like, he's like, he's like that oh, monster, and I just got monstered in my dream, and I was like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, wake up. So I was like, I was like, all right, I get it. It's like 6.33, and I'm meant to be listening to the show. So I got up. <laughs> So and that was the dot. That was the the dot episode. Yeah, yeah very yeah. good. Target individual. Target individual. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So um, but I and one thing I put together and this I I actually I upgraded Skype and I lost all my chat, but I I recorded all of Andrew's stuff from two years ago, and I went through it recently because I'm doing the documentaries and I'm looking for any any nugget, any hint sort of stuff, and you said. It was in in March, late March, 2013. It was around the 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 audit. You said you're in a dream time last night, and you were star charts, and you told me to go and look for a planet. And what I've come to put that together just recently was that I was listening to you and JP, and you said JP was a like a ray reader and stuff like that, and he had star charts in his DNA and all that sort of stuff. Well, last year. The group that I'm involved in, we like we're a very small group, and we did remote work, big remote work, and and there was one instance where there was an alignment of four of us, and um, by whatever means of us being together in synchronicity, and it was with solar flares as well. You know, there, there's a there's a breaking of the the prison sort of thing when solar flares kick in. There was a race of beings that are out there that had lost Earth, and we sent out the ping to them for them to to find Earth. And um, I, ble- I feel it was my soul code with the star charts in it that was aspect to it, you know what I mean? So you you planted that dream a long time ago, and I was like, I'm, I'm not aware of it, but 
it came together just recently. That's because I've seen people save other worlds that are lost in time. I've talked about timeline fallout shelters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are also worlds that are in time, still in timeline disasters that are still erased from our, our galaxy and our universe, mm-hmm. with billions of beings caught on them, stuck in a void space that have created their own acacia record frequency so they can create unentangled observer technology to come and entangle with parts of their self that are entwined into this paradox of the machine we have. Um, it's a unique system. So when we upload maps or systems, I've talked about this with Nat also, where quite literally we are putting together the galactic communication system and creating psychic networks. So things 95 degrees of separation of our universe in the middle of beyond explanation still have a frequency of where Earth is because it's implicately intertwined into the chaotic order that is now mm. where all of the timeline paradoxes are out of the hairball and into the moment of now zero point. the zero point mm. so when you uploaded those you completed your zero point mm. by planting that seed and you going through your own trials errors benefits rites of passage yeah. you saw what that teaching was for that teaching has also been duplicated for Natalie in her own sense because she is here to upload the codes to all the lost horsing clans. Mm-hmm. Okay. As well, is Steve with his dream time to exactly. all of us with the uh, elemental dragons. Each one of us has golden keys, and that's why it's so cool, because there's no hierarchical order. Each one of us has these really mm-hmm. cool gifts mm-hmm. that only you have. So there's no competition because only you, mm-hmm. this authentic, sovereign free will spark mm-hmm. that's the spark with the key and exactly. and it's so cool when people start to understand that exactly you know and then they can truly come together in union communion without hierarchical order without ego-based understandings and when when that comes through without um domination and control but with the purest of intent mm-hmm. god it's just so much fun i mean look at the shit that we get up to just the four of us talking <laughs> exactly <right now>. <laughs> <laughs> of course the chaos is my hand So we're going to move on to the next caller. Andre, are you there? I am, mate. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you doing today? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I wanted to call in and wish you a happy birthday for last week. I hope you got some time out for yourself. I know you've been really busy. So, um, um, I, got, I got two days off. <laughs> excellent. Very good. Because last year I remember you saying you went, you went away and you had this amazing experience with um, the fish in the water. The whales, yeah. I went to uh, yeah, yeah. Orcas Island, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How did the um, source, uh, the equinox stuff go over the weekend as well? Oh, it was a challenge. This was one of the most toughest equinoxes out there. Um, so many beings w- weren't able to recover from their winter depression, and their winter depression created, you know, their dark nights of the soul. And yeah. um from an animal perspective, you know, some of the horses that, you know, we work on in the particular neighborhood around here, there were huge, huge volumes of of passing of animals, especially pets, Mm -hmm. which greatly disturbed the local grid here that that ultimately created a deeper layer of depression, and it even showed in the trees that were trying to have the spring grow. Has it been really cold, your area of the world? No, rainy, 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 rainy. I'm on the foothills of Mount Rainier, so... The mountain acts like a massive weather resonator, and they, they'll chemtrail all the time over here, but it still doesn't matter. Yeah. So we'll, we'll yeah. have, you know, our winter here was 90 days of rain and fog, quite literally. And we maybe wow. had 10 days of sun in those 90 days. The rest was fog and rain. You know, like I live in Adelaide, Australia, you know that, but oh, yeah. the audience doesn't know, but... Um... It was very interesting because I heard that recording that you did on the 18th of February. That was with JP and um, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And um, 14th, 15th of March, I felt a really big shift. And um, it felt like there was a new energy from the sun. Oh, there was. um, There was. Yeah, yeah. Have you explained that on your show? I had a caller last week who looked at the sun and I and I explained yeah, yeah. to him that he changed. Um, that is something that I'm going to attempt to introduce of what 
change is, seeing different dimensions. Everyone has their own individual perspective of how to functionally see multidimensionally. And I'm trying to explain my individual perspective that's functionally seeing the Akashic Record. So yeah. it's getting down to the fundamentals of context, to the brass tacks of do you understand the linguistics? And if you do, it's an easy understanding. If you're missing the context of the linguistics, it will be tough for you because it is multidimensionally thinking, not linear thinking. So what's available to us? A ninth dimension. But everything in between our third dimension and the ninth dimension is not available to us. So if you're already not a pre-existing ninth dimensional frequency soul stream, you have no access to the ninth dimension, unless that's your direct intention from jumping from third to ninth dimension. That is one of the fundamental laws that has changed. So if there is a being here who no longer wants to be here and can prove it's a ninth dimensional dis unentangled observer that got caught here in the time wars, it can be immediately removed and not alter the time stream here. So what does that offer yeah. to the ancient controller beings? A golden parachute. That's their retirement parachute. Mm. So yeah, they, we're at the time where the CEOs of many businesses are going to pull their spiritual golden parachute ripcord. Yeah, the context, that's that's a big one because I remember you saying that and I was really feeling that out. And um, it's like the what I felt with that is what the baggage of people bringing in, like their beliefs and stuff like that. Um mm. The placebo what, effect is running our whole system right now. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. 2014, it was done. The galactic ascension machine turned off. It's like that car you take the key out of and the engine's still running. Mm. Yeah. Because we don't want it to stop yet. I'll, I'll say this with the previous caller as well. I mean, like, I was feeling out what questions to ask you for a while and stuff, and I was actually going to ask you what oil was in a planet. <laughs> so you actually cover that in the last one. It, it's the but, cranial fluid, as well as what allows biological planetary neural synapses to be stored and then radiated into stone, and the stone converts that vibration to a surface expression of connection to the Earth. So it's a way to transfer Earth's cranial fluid into energy so that we at the surface feel the love of Earth. Yeah, because I remember um, there was a guy called Fletcher Prouty that talked about how in the 1890s there was like this conference and the Rockefellers sent some agents over to get oil convinced to the world that it was a, um, a fossil fuel. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Fletcher Prouty was the guy that was Colonel X in Oliver Stone's JFK movie. And, um, yeah, that was quite fascinating to me. So, I mean, that, that, that was why I was going to ask you what oil was and how it got convinced to that. So, one of the truths that's going to come out is stuff like Lawrence of Arabia. When they were searching for the oil areas, they were actually searching for technology that mm -hmm. brought the cranial fluid or oil of Earth into big cauldrons, and this cauldron would feed a womb chakra. Mm. So Lawrence of Arabia was about discovering the technology to lure oil to the surface so that you'd have access to the cranial fluid, which then would have been shipped into containers to be burnt in a car. Wow. Instead of naturally for the growth of new living sentient organisms to feel the connection and love to Earth, which then was converted into a pollution. Mm. So the big oil booms, they knew that these big volumes of oil were actually sentient. They could actually send um, sensors down there and actually get some form of alpha wave sentience resonating through the oil. And they would oftentimes have to kill this before they could pump the oil out. More layers, man. I'm just like trying not to well. <laughs> um, yeah, can I tie something up with that last color as well? Like sure. You, met, you mentioned with the vaults of wealth and stuff with um, the, the resources from Atlantis. What stage in Atlantis was it like? 
Atlantis one, two, three. Atlantis three at fourteen thousand years. So at nine thousand years would have been the the rough the end of the end of Atlantis technology. All technology would have failed at that point. Okay. But from twenty six thousand years till till right around the nine thousand year, there was still technology on the planet. They still build spaceships, but at much much smaller level. The surface mm-hmm. had been so so destroyed through reality altering weapons that literally prevented the surface reality from reforming into the surface. It was just a swirl of a mush of energy that, that had no form. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right at the end of that sort of whole That's period, the rift wars when 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 Earth itself had open dimensional rifts all over it like big gigantic wounds and stuff would bleed over from one reality to another to another until finally that part of the hairball ended of time travel wars. Interesting. So all that remaining wealth, which was knowledge, wisdom, physical wealth, resource wealth, etc., etc., was was spread all over the world because beings in the final destruction of Atlantis ultimately knew that the corruption had reached such high layers that if there were not truly altruistic beings thinking of the ancient future, there would be no ancient future. So it's a bit like you talk about how sort of the aspect that's in control is very service to self orientated. So it was like a parallel to that to then to now. Because well. of the rift wars that had gone on, Atlantis versus yeah. Lemuria, Atlantis versus the Roman Empire, it's just something else that we'll begin to learn that when Caesar crossed the Rubicon and said Alia Yakta asked, it wasn't just for taking control. All right, that is our music. Everyone hold on. We'll come back and I'll finish those thoughts about uh, the Rubicon. And welcome back, everyone. Andre, are you there? Yeah, yeah, man. So I was talking about uh, brain fart here a second. Yeah, uh, don't worry. I've forgotten as well. Hey, <laughs> it was important. <laughs> uh, it will come back. The cranial fluid of the earth. Ah, the cranial fluid of the earth. There we go. So the cranial fluid of the earth, um, it's created, how do I put this? Us burning the cranial fluid of earth has disconnected us from our, our natural fluidic pulse that connects us to the earth. The passing of the seasons, the moving of the stars creates a longer term cranial pulse. When Atlantis ended, it represented a death of another cranial pulse. But Earth doesn't have one single cranial pulse. It has tens of thousands because it's a multidimensional, multifunctional being. It ended its old experience of having the allowance of the rift wars to be existing on its surface. So all external source-based beings that were trying to resolve karma could send everything into the rifts, and the rifts would ultimately poop out on the other side something else that is us, that is the final expression of the resolution of all karma. And this new pulse that's taking effect is literally a recreation of the oil, the recreation of the silver, of the copper, of the gold that has been taken out of this earth by other off-world beings. And then in that void space of non-creation and new creation, we are going to be generating whole new forms of spiritual connections to this planet through our DNA. That is the whole purpose of the DNA, to be the sovereign interacting process of communication of the cranial pulse of this world, or the thousands of cranial pulses of this world, or the cranial pulse of another world. Very interesting. I mean, when you mentioned about the womb chakra, that was like, of course, it's got to be something to do with that as well. Well, um, in that womb chakra is where every individual being has access to infinite space, their own bubble of infinite space on Earth. Mm. And with that direct cranial pulse connection means you, in your infinite space, you can create a billion trees and nurture them for a trillion years and then ask those trees who wants to go to the surface of another world through the process of transmuting the energy here in my infinite space to grafting it on the surface of another world of a finite space so it can begin to have its infinite space. How about between the the male and the female expression with the connection to that then as well? 
Well, the cranial pulse is what triggers the birth and death process. It, it is in the cranial pulse that the synaptic energy transference from this world that says that there's a life and death process here. And that, that life and death process is not related to any frequency of labeled time. In between one generation of one cranial pulse into the next generation, or if the being can simultaneously experience more planet, planetary cranial pulses, so that it's a part of the bigger picture of what this world is trying to do, constantly birth people into the new higher frequency of light and energy. Mm. Okay, well then, can I tie this into what's going on in Syria and the Arab region sure. with the wars? Is mm -hmm. that the the significance of that connection with those womb chakras over there with the oil as well. Correct. Because that would wow. be the connection to the cranial pulse that is passing. That is the cranial wow. pulse when the Anunnaki invaded, and they invaded at a time where the rifts were not seen on the surface of the world. Um, they were hidden by technology, and when the Anunnaki got here, they got entangled in the rifts unknowingly. Uh, now I remember what I was going to say is... Uh, 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 Alia Yatka asked when Caesar passed the Rubicon. That is yeah. where Caesar was given, let's just say, the ability to move his troops from the river, the 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 from the river crossing of the river of the Rubicon, and he could be at the river and anywhere else in the world with an entire army and go and take over an area that might have been lightly defended by ancient technology, but nowhere near able to defend against ninety thousand. And this is where much of the Roman Empire or the Babylonian Empire began to understand that it can send its army beyond its borders and it would be in another space and time on the surface of this world. Like shock troops sort of thing and, and yes. be able to deploy rapidly and stuff to, to mitigate sort of anything that didn't have the technology. Yeah, that I was get, I get coming that. through the rips, correct. Wow, wow, wow. And yeah. this is how all of the individual bubbles of reality were conquered one by one by one by shutting down the individual rifts and the individual bubbles of infinite space that are available to everyone, but nobody was occupying those spaces. So when they occupied Syria, Jordan, etc., etc., it was to connect to the cranial pulse that was the initial concept that drew the Anunnaki here to create some form of change. At the same time, the Anunnaki, the Syrians were here, but they were just here on another timeline, so the Anunnaki... The Syrians and the Anunnaki never truly realized they were occupying the same planet at the same time. And um, the ultimate stirrers of this part, that the 15, that were sort of controlling all this as well? Manipulating, yes. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So that they could come to a point where there was so much crossover of mythology from worlds that off-world sources couldn't predict what belief system was going to last through generational time belief. So they had to once again result to the cranial pulse, thus why oil was turned into a new system of control. Because they can synthesize oil. Can they synthesize the same effect of burning cranial, the cranial fluid of Earth? That's the next layer of technology of imprint in us. So they want to give us an energy source that isn't the earth. Yeah, it's a bit like you've talked about gold a lot and the, um, you know, the, the specific regions of gold have a different energy that can hold the energy as well. I think there's a parallel to that, isn't there? As well as many other minerals and elements out there. Like the, 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 the mineral um, um, uh, azurite. Um, it's a blue stone that kind of looks like popcorn, but when you look at it close, it's crystal. If that were, let's just say, figured out how to make in mass a synthetic version of it alongside the natural version of it, you could create humongous energy machines that could just give free energy to everyone on the world. And this is a way to stay connected to our world versus science like describing a Tesla system, just giving you raw power and access to the atoms of the void. Mm. Everything is a spiritual medium or a capacitor to step energy from one dimension into another or from one dimension down to another. 
that's the form of energy technology we have interfunctioning and co-creating in our DNA skin suits. Yeah, yeah. One thing that really rings out to me is our 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 skin suit is the technology, you know. Like yeah. so, like even not relying on crystals and stuff like that because. Um, they they're have sort their, of placebos. Yeah, they, they got have purpose, their place. But... They have their place and their purpose as sovereign beings of this reality. So when we use crystals and understand that I am a sovereign being, that crystal is a sovereign being, and we are co-creating an experience together. There are times that we will have contrast with the crystal and the mineral community. They only become a crutch when we give our power away to the crystal, or the crystal gives away our power to us because we've demanded it. Yeah, I'll try and keep this a bit short because I know your show's coming to an end. I think you've got other callers, but um, I I spent like the last six months of last year really getting into your revocations, and um, like you've I've heard you mention how like doing it once is like a clean and jerk in a um, like in the Olympics you're probably going to pull a muscle or something like that. Right. And, um, um, I really got into them and went to places in my city and stuff like that. And what I'll offer to the audience is that by me doing that over like a six-month period, like maybe reading them out loud for half an hour, a couple of times a week at least, if not a day, it actually revealed a lot of my purpose, mate. <laughs> I'm sure it did because it sent everything to the edges of your spiritual borders and it yeah. wasn't constantly bombarding your sympathetic and parasympathetic senses. Yeah, yeah. And um, Adelaide, I'm sure not many people know about this, but Rupert Murdoch's news media was basically started here. Yep. Um, you, you, like I had a reading with you back in 2013, and you said Earth wanted me back in Adelaide. Was that part of the reason, mate? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. It, it, it has you there for a number of reasons mainly because of the souls that are going to be awakening there. They're so similar to you that yeah. being anywhere else would just be the stupid choice. Okay. Okay? You've got, you've, got your, you've got your soul family homies everywhere around you. They just don't know it yet. Yeah, yeah, I've got to be patient like you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I've got, I got to appreciate your patience with me because... Um, one thing, like, I had a lot of time with you back in 2013, and, and I actually never wanted to know anything about me. That might be pretty ironic with a lot of people because I had so much time with you. But um, I also realized, and this is something you can probably offer, is that I probably have a soul contract to sort of work it out for myself. And if you told me you would have probably violated my free will, would that be a correct assessment? Yes and no. Yeah. Sometimes when you ask a source a question, you're not ready for the answer. But that doesn't mean you can't hear the answer. Mm. Okay? And yeah. then there are other times where it's exactly the opposite. If you ask a question and you are not truly ready for the answer, it could drastically alter your course. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've been struggling that line with a lot of people because I'm pretty perceptive and it was like, mm -hmm. you know, Failure is a good teacher and, and realizing the outcome because you have to feel the energy and stuff. But um, respecting the individual's journey is paramount, you know. And so so one, one other thing is you have very, very broad spiritual contracts. You, you were, let's just say, a master spiritual contract writer. It's almost like poetry. And the system is going, oh, I should have never let this in. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a metaphor for that. I, I, like, um, if if spiritual contracts were a buffet, I went all you could eat. Yes, all you can you eat, know. I'd eat all you can. Yeah, <laughs> you take it all in. <laughs> Sometimes it's a, you know, it, it's a buffet. It's a, yeah, yeah. So. Well, Andre, I must move on to the next. Yeah, move color. on, mate. Cause Thank you so much. So much time. But all yeah, right. thanks, mate. Thanks for what you do. You're Cheers. welcome. All right. We're going to move on to our next caller. Our next caller is Andre. Is this the Andre from Australia? 
It is, mate. How you doing? Andre, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, mate. Thanks for letting me through and finding you again. And um, the two of you holding on for over six months now. I mean, how have you guys been going with your show? Um, it's been uh, nine months now, actually. Nine months, yeah. Yeah, going on ten. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun. It's we've been a given blast. birth already. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's a new um, show. <laughs> you guys are anchoring it, you know, like yeah. to do it week in, week out, week out. You know, I know there's been a lot going on, so um, I'm grateful for that because yeah, the volume out there of info and stuff is pretty phenomenal, and um, I've still got a lot of shows to go through, so I, I'm I'm grateful for that, guys. And, and that's the challenge of a two-hour format. You know, we're asking people now to listen to 16 hours of material a month. And for some people, you know, that cuts into their family time. It cuts into whatever. And they, they, they chew away at it at their, own, at their own pace. You know, when, when Kathy and I decided that we wanted to do a show, we know we were going to be doing eight hours a month. And then, you know, nine months later, we gave birth to another one, which is another eight hours a month. But it has also expanded – um, our our own audience, the way we do presentations, because the other show is a- allowing us to take what we've distilled from all these reading shows and give it all as raw advice, raw tools, raw tips, raw techniques. Yeah, yeah. Like um, for me personally, I I was in that place for that last call. It was I felt it, and um, a big thing for me was actually accepting and owning my power, and um. Like, say, you you guys are sort of there to offer the information, but, say, we've individually got to take the steps because when we do, we get the, the benefit from it. So um, That's right, even if it's a baby step. Yeah, yeah, you get it because you can look back in hindsight and um, realize what you did, and then you build on that. So um, well, that's, that's living and being multidimensional. When we allow our living life to have multidimensional concepts, an innate part of it, we we manifest specialty skills. You know, you've had your specialty skills, you know, throughout your lifetime with music and DJing and, and a lot of the other stuff we've talked about. But yeah. innately, there's even more into you that you know you haven't even uncovered yet. Mm-hmm. Well, that's partly why I'm here, I guess, mate. So yeah. um, you're, you're like, before... I think I've turned over every rock and I'm not finding any more rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah. What, what, what has it that, that has brought yourself to a, a halt of turning over the rocks that you've all turned over? Was it a repetition of concept or was it a I'm tired of doing the same thing? What was the emotional thing that slowed down the journey? I, I'm, I tend to be really thorough and I exhaust like topics thoroughly. Mm-hmm. So I'm... Um, you know, when you go down a path, you sort of don't feel like you're getting anywhere. So it's it's the the sort of assessing where you are to reassess a different pathway. Mm-hmm. And, so when you um, go back some, and do you go back and do your assessment, you realize you're you're one part you're treading water, another part you're taking baby steps, and these other parts aren't really moving at all. Yeah, or maybe I've just gone too fast and missed stuff as well, you know. So, that, too. Um, that too. Yeah, yeah, it just depends on the moment and stuff. But I like to sort of, um, like one thing that's really pushed me forward is actually making mistakes. Mm-hmm. And a mistake is like, say society sees a mistake as a mistake, but for me it's just more data. So it's like, and and from a perception point of view, point of view when you're dealing with this reality, it's like if you make a mistake, it's like, Nah, you've you you just got a potential that you haven't realized. So sometimes making mistakes in this reality is just revealing a potential that you didn't realize you had. So um, or it's a potentialized potential you realized you had, but you never actualized it. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. where a lot of people in the awakening community are stuck at is that actual actualization. There are a set of choices that are subtly within our field that determine if we are going to trust ourselves enough to use the power of our own belief to empower a process to be followed through and done with the moments of hindsight that show us our moments of growth from all the different choice points it took us to get to where we were to make something actualized in our environment. Yeah, yeah. A big one for me was self-worth as well. 
I mean, um, self worth, in- self doubt, all of those things are meant to yeah. do what? Keep you giving away power. Yeah, yeah, on a on a subtle level, that's like I, I sort of see us. We're all born into this reality, and we're playing passengers, and um, those sort of things are fabrics of the reality, and you've you've got to go through things to maybe um, short circuit them and and trigger the change and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, have you been able to do any personal ceremonies for yourself? Um, Just you, no one else. Yeah, yeah. I did one um, May 21st. Is that a good one? You, I mean, you know, you're across me pretty well, but I did yeah. one, yeah. the full moon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you should consider doing it every full moon. Thank you. Or start paying attention to the space weather and look for specific times where you know there are going to be solar flares. Yeah, I, I um I feel them and stuff. So um I mean I had a question I've got a lot of questions and stuff. I know we've got a bit of time. Um yeah, yeah, go ahead with your questions. Yeah, yeah, well I mean the first thing I was gonna actually ask you is um you know, there's a six weeks or two months out to your conference. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people around the world that are probably gonna be listening to this that are probably are going or they're not aware they're going and stuff. Do you have any advice for those people to, say, prepare themselves physically now so when they get there, they'll be ready to go? If you are going to make the journey, it's already complete. Yeah, I know that. If you believe you need to do anything else to make the journey complete, then there's an issue of self-doubt. And so for all those people that want to go to the event – Every effort has been made for you for for people to go. It was a matter of can you manifest in your own reality the spirit power it takes to create a journey that is going to be a culmination in a learning event? Is my seminar any different than anyone else's seminar? Any more more powerful or less powerful, even if it was a Christian seminar? Mm. Yeah. The answer is it's in the, each person's individual belief. Those that are meant to be for this first event in three years will be there. But it's still the journey there. And a lot of people are afraid of the journey because it means they will have to go out of their static reality and into a dynamic reality where they may not have programs or energy concepts that are ready to deal with that form of change all right andre hold on we'll come back after the after the music all right and welcome back everyone we are continuing our conversation with andre are you there yeah can you hear me is it clear now yep 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 that was me being being dumb before i was rubbing rubbing my beard as i was talking (laughs) to you covering up my mic you crack me up. <laughs> I was in an intellectual moment. <laughs> uh, I've been I've been in a like a my inner child moment for the, like the last few weeks. So um, yeah, I've been messing around a bit. So, so you you were talking about about coming to the event and what people can do. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, on a, on a more individuated level, if somebody believes they haven't done something to earn something, you got to go back to that self worth process are you worthy enough to go to the event without having have done that stuff or is there something you're subtly holding over your own self in judgment about a lot of people that are waiting to the end are are just wait to the end it's an impulse buy okay that's the global world of distraction that's just how that infrastructure works if we judge ourselves that we're worthy for something five months ahead of time, what are we telling ourselves? That we're worthy. Exactly. Five months ahead of time, as opposed to one month ahead of time. (laughs) I'm worthy. (laughs) I'm going. Is one more powerful than the other? Mm. The answer is no. Each is a moment in which we made a set of choices that we gave value to what the event brings in potential to us 
where we gave value to our own individuated journey and that though our journey may need some tweaks and little bits in here and there as changes, that doesn't make our journey less valuable to not go. So much of the reasons for people coming to the event are going to be self-worth. And then there'll be those others who have that, that dagging question they want answered or the ones that we hear all the time that say, I dream, I've had a dream with you, Andrew. How many callers have you heard that with Kathy? Oh, a lot. A lot. Camp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That many. So those are other things that are triggers for people to come to anybody else's event. You know, people dream about other people other than me. You know, all the, the presenters out there are, are on stage, the, the physical stage and the dream world stage, whether they know it or not. You know, you oftentimes hear me talking about being in a stadium of people with other people in the center of the stadium talking to tens of thousands of people simultaneously, teaching, talking, and yet individually tutoring every single person simultaneously. And then there are times that I meet a group of people in a, in a, in a dream place. So just the other day, I was um, catching up on an old video game I used to play called StarCraft. And it was one of the original games that you can play on local area networks. It was the original networking game. And it turns out 20 years later, there's a professional league for this. And I happened to watch a couple videos where they had a professional announcer in the whole nine yards. And later that night, I met the guy in a dream world. <laughs> yeah, that's really, really synchronicity. <laughs> Synchronicities. Okay. Synchronicities are the other things that drive people. Are they going to come to an event? Is the a group of synchronicities that are right in front of you that says you have to pull out the card and book the tickets and do this right now, or are we just not seeing them around us? The room could hold 700 people. <laughs> <laughs> we scaled it for that. My, my feeling, mate, was it's reunion time. So, um, yeah, like, uh, I, as soon as you mentioned that, I was actually setting up for a mission, like, and the mission wasn't really fitting, but I was prepared physically for it. It took me a year to sort of get my body right and stuff. And, um, it was just like, I was in a bit of a mess. I was like, man, it's just not happening. It's not happening, All right? I'll just allow it and stuff. And then all of a sudden you, you mentioned conference and I was like, bingo. And I was preparing for this like, um, um, like deadline that I wasn't going to conform to. And then all of a sudden I had extra months and it was like, cool, I can, I can sort of fit it in now. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, yeah. The um, challenge of planning an event with a no time person is choosing a date and time. I think you've got a perfect, it just feels excellent, mate. Like yeah. you even go into another level and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. Well, there, there's, a, there's an evolution, you know, for those that have been around since the beginning, you know, you've heard the, the varieties of evolution or when I was bored of talking about one subject or another, mm. you know, I got to tell you something, I, I, I could really care less about reporting on the pop, the political news, the conspiracy news right now, because I'm now labeling it all as part of that global infrastructure of distraction. We have come to point the point where we can no longer play the game the way the system wants to play the game. We must create our own rules, eliminate ourselves from the exchanging of energy, find that mystical within us, and yet still live within the system that's going to continue to try to engage us in the infrastructure of distraction that it has, whether it's Amazon or this or whatever, whatever it is that's going to distract you from giving yourself self-valued and self-worthy times of earning your self-trust through healing yourself, seeking out others to heal yourself, or teachers that can give you wisdom so that you can pass it on to your own environment. I became innately aware of this when I was nine at a baseball game that inevitably I would be presenting at a higher level and I was the one that had to learn how to do it. Just because you're shown the future doesn't mean you're going to follow through with it. 
yeah, the whole potential thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, actualize, I've been feeling that out. Yeah. Yeah. We actualize our potentials. So the the whole expression of a no time person giving a date and time, I actualized a date. That's all that I did. Mm. In which everything that's dreaming with me must take as a solid point in reality. What is a solid point in reality? It's that floating zero point frequency of all energy. In the artificial intelligence revocation, it is making a place of all space time codes. It's like having the first spiritual telephone book. Think of how our world changed when telephones came on, came around. They had to create books for them. You had to get numbers for them. You had to teach people how to use it. That's what we're coming to now. A whole new phone book. It's exciting. If you could call, call upon a, a oracle from another world, if you had a 1-900, you know, your Pleiadian oracle phone number, would you call it? If yeah. it was available? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dying now. <laughs> Okay. If you had those numbers available, you had an infinite amount of numbers of people in an infinite perspective, would you make 10 calls a day? Knowing that that person's not going to diss you and not take your phone call. Because we're multidimensional beings. There's always a part to receive us. As long as we don't come in polarity. With charge. With intention behind us to limit expression. People are coming together into an event that's going to take the limits off of expression, take the limits off of even our language. I'm going to challenge the race amnesia at the highest levels. And for all those that are going to be there live for it, you're going to get to feel it. And for those that will be watching it in video afterwards, you'll feel it too. But you won't have that live experience. The whole point of doing a live event manifested in time was to make it a ritual ceremony of expression of creativity, bringing all the other people that have been connected to the expressive creativity of the last many years that have wanted to come and be a part of it. I've only done a handful of events, and I, I turn events down left and right. And it's not because I don't believe in the individual people that are running events. It's just not my time then. There were a variety of people that needed their time to say their point of view. And you could even go to the original galactic history. In some areas, it was so complex, but simple. And there's still people today coming to it and calling it the seminal work of the next level. There's no one else out doing what I do. There's no one else doing readings the way that I do. There's no one else doing the volume and size in which I do because the very first thing that I put out was to a challenge of all presenters that the race amnesia has a line at 2,600 years. Anything that you think happened beyond 2,600 years is a complete and total fallacy. You will have in your knowingness more ability to know truth than what has been presented in our history books that have only been written by the conquerors and reinterpreted re each generation by its fanatics. That's the harshness of our world. And we can take that harshness away by giving ourselves the time to meditate, to observe our DNA helix inside our heart space and know that's what created us. That's the spiritual technology of incarnation, of birth, of life itself. Consciousness began as a stream of light that entered a, a spark of an egg and a sperm that came together. And in that unique, infinite moment of a spark, consciousness became a localized event instead of a non-localized, etherical, everywhere, infinite source. And this event is giving birth to a new form of creation, a new form of connectivity, so that everyone can take that home in their own lesson and spread it to the rest of the world. I haven't had one of those eerie silences in a while. 
I, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna butt in and say, "Hey, mate, speaking of race amnesia, do you want to go galactic on me now?" Sure, I'll go galactic but, on you now. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, I'll just prefer like preface this as saying like I've actually known Andrew for a long time and I've actually avoided this, but um last November and and I mentioned that year of prep I, I did a enormous amount of healing the revocations and all sorts of stuff and colonics and that and it sort of prepped me for around November where I did a healing with my shaman and um first of all I had I went with an intent to call back my soul shards and um he actually used uh, he uses sacred living uh, young living oils and he actually used gathering in that healing and I had a like a Chinese martial artist like past life bleed through that came back and I, I picked up the, um, the injury from that that death but then the next healing later on he actually pressed me in my gut mm. and um, he told me to smile at myself and I saw my soul and that that was an enormous thing for me because it felt like a completion of calling back on my shards mm -hmm. and I saw myself on the soul level. And, um, yeah, then it was like the avoidance with not seeking this out from me, Andrew was like, there was purpose because I had to do it myself. Like, um, correct. Yeah. You're, you're, you're right. There was a, an attitude and a, a, and a, and a, an affinity for wanting to do it yourself. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Develop so, those muscles. You yeah, know what so, I mean? I'm going to going to start with some of your galactic history because your theme you've got two themes the 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 you get to the to the apex of your creation and somebody steals it from you or kills you mm. and then you get to the apex of your creation and you defeat those that are trying to kill you but the message is unheard because there isn't an infrastructure to spread it yeah okay that's that's the two themes your soul's going back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth with. So I think one of the more important lifetimes for you to actually truly pay attention to is when you lived on the Pleiadian homeworld of Alcyon, where you were in, a, in a, an expression. You ever heard of the three tenors? Yeah, yeah. So the three, the three male Pavarotti singers, et cetera, et cetera. You were an equivalent of that on their world but not in entertainment form. You were able to sing as, as the tenor in a voice harmony with the actual conscious mind of the planet. So you could be chorus to the planet or lead singer to the planet. And there were groups of three to 25 that would come together in star patterns on various specialty energy points around the planet and they would begin to sing well, then the planet would then share your song with all other high frequency beings who are looking to share in a ritual of global chorus a way of to excite global dream time to bring all species on the surface of the world in a higher form of awareness no matter what they're doing as they're filling out their daily job to bring the highness of multi-dimensional awareness through the power of song, psychic song, telepathic song. You gained in such notoriety and specialty for what you did until you began singing with not one planet, but several dozen planets at a time. To them, you were the greatest superstar of a, of a baritone that was out there. To the highest regards where there are even monuments on the world to you that created an entire infrastructure for spiritual people to let go of their physical worlds and take the journey on the celestial song path. How's that resonate? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm feeling it through my body, but it makes sense in this life because um, a lot of people, they hear my voice. They don't know what it is, and they get triggered by it. So, um, right. whether it's just yeah. whether it's just in the recording and stuff like that. So, I've had a chat with you and stuff. It's because so, um, they've heard your voice in other soul level. Tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, some I of them that. weren't. They weren't Pleiadians. You know, your music was traded amongst worlds. Mm. 
So that's why I'm into DJing as well. Well, the music that's, the, the that's, that's the scale. I mean, you're not working with celestial minds and billions of beings simultaneously. You're just working with one dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, the interest in music, you know, and what it does. The interest in music like, is yeah. it, it because it's the exchange of energy. Yeah, yeah. Okay? It's a fundamental exchange of energy that, you know, within your own chords, you can create all of the rules that can prevent energy thievery around your songs. Mm -hmm. That you can create it, a, make it a consciousness, a collective consciousness creation, as well, of a, as well as a consciousness creation that can stand the legacy of time. Mm -hmm. That's why you chose music as the fetus, because you knew you could create the legacy. And you came in this lifetime to create a legacy that would be valued, that would be seen and not be stolen. Yeah, yeah. So there are other things in your galactic history very similar to this, this you know, galactic baritone or a Pleiadian baritone, except you're not a physical being. You're much older. You're, you're even before the expression of when the Pleiadians and Arcturians, so you would have been around 158 million years ago. So really stretch your mind to go that far back into your history and realize that you lived as a being of energy who would go between nebula to nebula to nebula. And each nebula has its own background chorus and music of the sentient being that holds space in the nebula to make the form of the nebula and then all the things that live inside it and some of these beings are energy and other of them are like giant space whales that are physical form that may be out of, made of, out of variety of materials but there are still a biological skin suit in space and this is some of your centricity of originally coming to being was functioning in the vast nebulas that were creating the most primal forms of life in the most intricate forms of skin suits that could travel galaxies or universes. There were certain types of nebulas that were nursing areas for special skin suits similar to like a shark or a whale that could go through space, but they could travel in between universes. Mm -hmm. And you were a, a nurturer of those skin suits and would often encourage physical beings who were traveling in light ships inside your nebula to make companionship with these inter-universal beings in the nebula, facilitating a communication so micro-beings can be trans transported via this process from one universe to another, one galaxy to another at whatever scale that was needed to be done. Fascinating. So the whole, like, tuning into Earth thing, when did that all start? You're too old to not realize you were part of the creating of it. Mm. I, I have been told that. Okay. Yeah. So when did you first say I'm going to put my name on this approval of the plan because <laughs> you were part of the creating of the plan too yeah you, you mentioned created beings recently in some shows so um, so not, not found beings to... not, not no no yeah. no I'm talking like the actual creation of the galactic ascension machine the creation of the original creation of earth before the galactic ascension machine was created when Earth was just a planet out there compared to a bunch of other planets that was in non-free-willed universe. Before yeah. our universe became free-willed, you were already here, fully established, and a part of the paradigm that was going to create a seventh-density galactic seed planet because you knew full well that there was a massive immigration of people that were going to come to this universe after it became free-willed, and you wanted to create an inter-universal infrastructure of... of how to get life to this new, new places. Yeah, and I mean, I felt that, and that's why I'm here in this life, aware with all the stuff I'm, like, I'm in the game, so to speak. You You're know? here because Earth becomes the focus point for that original dream to actually come to fruition. 
Mm. Earth can create 200 womb chakras. It can create its own portals and gateways greater than a thousand suns combined. Most suns can only connect to a, a few thousand different, different places. One portal on Earth can connect to every place in the universe, even the places not connected, not created yet. Mm. That's the uniqueness of Earth. Every individual being can't have an infinite space living on this world. Imagine seven billion three hundred million human beings, each with their own infinite space. A lot of potential. A lot yeah. of potential. And when everything has its own infinite space, the levels of creation that we are challenged with is why you came here to Earth. Why mm. you're still here. You got soul shards all spread throughout the universe, as, as, do, as do many others. But it is this, Andre, of this lifetime, that this I am presence that is going to earn the victory passage feather that says, I survived the galactic ascension machine and I came out the other side at eight color experiencing being. Mm. No other version of Andre is going to have that badge of honor. Yeah. That's and why you, you talk. Yeah, you talk about the eight color and um, the soul thing that I mentioned that I saw. I saw myself as a golden child. Is that a, an expression of the eighth color relative to me or generally? Or? I know. That is a previous incarnated version of you who came in as the golden child when we were a six color experiencing world where the seventh color was stolen from us. And there was a large variety of external beings who forced their way inside here and brought the seventh color back. Fascinating. I haven't really actually talked about that <laughs> because Earth started as a seventh density world and then reduced to six, five, four, three, two, one. We are seven color experiencing beings in a third density world. Are those four colors missing or do we actually have to be the ones that manifest our light here for the other four colors to exist? That was one of the fundamental reality programs that they try to change here, was to take the prism out of the third eye so that it couldn't create all seven colors. Thank you, mate. Thank you. All right, everybody.